awe, Kay glimpses himself in a full-length mirror. Hollow cheeks, sunken stomach, spindly legs, rips like a charcoal sketch of famine. Other nude bodies, ghostly and steam, pass in a line. In modesty, he turns away, but he sees, then, uniformed men, like guards in some straf colony, hurting the others through doors. The flesh of their bodies is as haggard as their faces. The men are all circumcised. Then come the women, faces downcast, but some turn to him. Otla, Ellie, Valley. Another woman turns her imploring face to him. Milena? The doors close, and he is alone, but for two guards murmuring in German the angelic tongue of Goethe and Kleist. Kay is invisible to them. Their gleaming leather boots, their gray uniforms, the stark black and white device on their red armbands show none of the Prussian love of pomp. This is something new, yet it is the old story. Enough then, let it be done. Let every child of Israel be run through the harrow and tattooed with the name of his crime, Judah. All but K the Invisible be impervious. Instead of him, they have taken Milena, not even a Jew, for the crime of having loved him. The vision passes. K dresses, slowly apprehending that the hotel is not style, but a force as implacable as history. He has lived through one world war and will not see another. But unlike Ives with his one world utopianism, unlike Stevens in the protected precincts of his being, Kay knows that another war is coming.